was one of two Democrats in 1982 when Wakefield started the um, High School Democratic Committee. It has gone grown since then, thank goodness. Um, after, um, I, I've stayed in the area my whole life. I was a, pro a prosecutor for Middlesex County um, for several years, um, serving our district. Uh, and then I moved to Suffolk University Law School, where I've been for 21 years. I'm an associate dean of students, and I also um, teach. I'm a daughter of a first grade teacher for 30 years and a probation officer. Public service has been in my blood, um, and I've um, committed myself to that my whole professional, my adult uh, life. I've been on the Wakefield Town Council for the past seven years. Prior to that, I was a member of the Board of Health for six years. In Wakefield, we've had great success, um, both financially and expanding services. And I think we're a little bit unique in that, um, in the area. We've been able to um, not have an override, and in, in, I would have supported the override, I'm pretty sure if I was in Melrose based on the, the infusion of funds that you needed for the schools, but we've been able to avoid that in Wakefield by um, collaborating with other towns, by um, saving a lot of money moving to the GIC before other communities did so, by funding OPEV, um, uh, the retirement benefit um, for our workers at a much higher fund than other communities and really reaping that benefit. Because of that, Wakefield has a AAA bond rating, which allows us to do projects at a low interest rate, and we've been able to do projects via debt exclusion. So while we have saved our um, citizens some money, we've also expanded um, a lot of services, and I'm very happy to be a part of that um, and within its leadership. Um, we've created similar to Melrose, Human Rights um, Commission. We're doing great work with um, tax um, programs for our elderly, trying to recognize that our um, demographics of our students come Wakefield looks different in upping those services as well. Um, I've worked um, volunteering my whole life as a uh, PTO, in the PTO, as a room mother um, while working full time, coaching t ball, coaching um, my daughter in basketball. My husband and I have two uh, children, Bridget, 17, will be 17 in a few weeks. Connor will be 19 um, in a few weeks. He's a freshman at Catholic University. Um, and I feel very proud that I've raised two responsible, empowered. Um, kind to children. So uh, my decision to run for state rep is just to continue, I think, the good work that I've done um, in Wakefield in going to the state house is all about um, personality. It's all about making connections. And I believe my abilities that I learned as a DA, working with students for the past 21 years, will allow me to work at the state house level to bring the same kind um, of leadership there. Things I'm committed about is having Massachusetts pass the Roe Act, um, still focusing on civil rights. We live in a community, a uh, state that's very liberal, we're proud of what we've done, but we really need to do better on certain issues in, in, um, in, in a way that's different than what we're seeing at the federal level. This campaign has been lovely because it's been very civil and kind, um, and I'm, I can't imagine it not being out of the way, so we're proud to be a part of it um, based on what we're seeing at the federal level. So um, that is who I am, and I would um, welcome I would love to. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Matt Hellman. Uh, some of you uh, may know me uh, from my role uh, as Senator Jason Lewis's communications director for four years, where I kept communities informed about what was going on at Beacon Hill, uh, as well as overseeing and, and executing his community conversations issue discussion series in all the communities. I spent four years serving the people of Malden, Melrose, and Wakefield, as well as Reading, uh, Winchester, and Stoneham. Uh, I also had the opportunity while living in Melrose, uh, I've lived in Malden for the last three years, Melrose for seven years before that. I had the opportunity to serve as an appointee of Mayor Dolan on the Melrose Human Rights Commission, uh, where I had the wonderful opportunity to work with uh, Jackie Lavender Bird when she was on then Board of Aldermen. Uh, now City Council uh, to uh, advance a, a municipal ordinance uh, banning discrimination against transgender people in public accommodations. Melrose became the 10th community statewide to pass an ordinance before the Commonwealth passed uh, those civil rights protections statewide, and it was in part because a number of communities, uh, including Melrose, stepped up and, and got the ball rolling. Uh, my favorite job is 
uh, dad to six-year-old Carson, and I'm jealous of Kate that your kids still nap, uh, because he has a tremendous amount of energy, um, but it's wonderful. Um, and uh, before I go into a little bit more about my background and my platform, I want to give a very quick history lesson that kind of uh, undergirds exactly why I'm fighting for what I'm fighting for. Uh, you'll hear a lot from Senator Markey this year about the mid-70s when he was a state legislator representing Malden and Melrose uh, and the incident where he crossed uh, a very iron-fisted speaker and they threw his furniture out in the hallway and, and he said, well, you can tell me where to sit, but you can't tell me where to stand. That was the mid-70s. Fast forward an entire generation. My first job in state government in 2002 uh, as legislative aide for state representative Ruth Balzer of Newton a very progressive legislator who had the ire of then Speaker Tom Finneran, who was an autocratic, iron-fisted speaker who was notorious for if you crossed him, you'd get your office moved from the fourth floor down to the basement, you'd lose choice com uh, committee assignments. Very iron-fisted speaker, everything needed to get his say so. Fast forward 20 years to today, and we have an iron-fisted autocratic speaker uh, in Speaker DeLeo. Every piece of legislation, every amendment and every budget item needs his approval or it dies. That's not democracy and we need to restore uh, a healthier balance to make our state government more transparent and less dysfunctional uh, because uh, Speaker DeLeo doesn't just have more power than the governor uh, because of a veto-proof majority that the voters send to the legislature and that's fine, but he has more power than the seven million residents of Massachusetts combined because he decides what legislation passes and what gets in the budget single-handedly. That's not healthy for our state government, and that's part of the reason that I'm running. Uh, we need a, a, a leadership change, and that takes representatives, 160 of us in the House, to say, no, that's not how it should be. Be willing to stand up to him and put constituents, the, the residents of the district, ahead of fealty to the speaker. In addition, we clearly have a crisis in our public transportation. Uh, the MBTA is, on a good day, an unreliable mess. Um, four derailments last year, and I believe the Orange Line leads the league in track fires. That's not, that's not a good record to have. We need more transparency, more funding, and a leadership change there because of the lack of communication that happens between the senior management and the staff on the ground and commuters. Uh, Additionally, there are a number of progressive priorities. The Roe Act was mentioned uh, based on what uh, Trump and Mitch McConnell are doing to the federal judiciary. We need to pass the Roe Act not only to protect reproductive rights in Massachusetts, but to be an example to the other 49 states. We used to lead on things like public education, gun safety, civil rights, and we haven't led on anything in a while. We have the opportunity to do it with the Roe Act, with the Safe Communities Act to both protect public safety and the civil rights of our immigrant neighbors. Uh, with uh, measures like the Fair Share Amendment so that we can uh, fund our government more progressively and have the resources to invest uh, in our public transportation and other priorities. And so these are some of the things I'm fighting for. I encourage you to check out matt4ma.com, just one T in Matt. Uh, and I welcome your questions and I hope to earn your support over the course of the night and the next few weeks. Thank you so much. One question we'll ask of all three candidates, so if you can make it a little more broad um, to apply to all the candidates, that would be great. Um, and we'll start with Anne this time. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> really? <laughs> so I've never come to a place and been that awed by three candidates right in a row. Um, thank you for running. Um, <laughs> So happy to see um, you know the bills pass and you know, really help our education system. What do you think is standing in the way of moving us forward in education, and how would you try to um, help that for for our state? Good, sure. Um, well, I think the the recent passage of the education bill is a huge first step, with, which will make that were underperforming and were not um, funded um, to where they
they should be to um, address the new demographics of students moving in, ESL learners, um, and that's a huge step. The next step has to be to make sure it's funded well, um, and to make sure that we support our local communities, um, that all of the onus is not set in certain testing criteria or the hoops that the, the local communities have to jump through are not too prohibitive. Um, as I said, I'm a, a daughter of a public school teacher. My mom taught Saugus for 30 years, and I, and I teach in higher education, but I have a real, I would love to see um, the uh, dependence and obsession with MCAS be tweaked. Um, I know from a law school standpoint, that we have the, this thing called the bar at the end of law school that we want to make sure our students pass the bar. But the best teachers, I don't think teach the bar. They're teaching them how to be learners. They're teaching them how to be deep divers. They're teaching them how to be analytical um, and to address um, any problem that comes before them. I've talked to many teachers, many in Wakefield, some in Melrose, who have said that it's so frustrating. Um, and this was a kindergarten teacher who said that she feels like she, she can't teach the kids to share and, and um, emotional uh, development and that kind of IQ because now the, the structure put on kids in kindergarten is, is crazy. So for education, we've taken a great start, first step with the Student Opportunity Act. The funding is excellent. It has to be implemented in a way that really raises our, our kids up to be the best they can. And I do think we need to look at how local As was mentioned, the Student Opportunity Act provides uh, a great deal uh, of new resources. It's uh, 1.5 billion over the next seven years, I think is the figure. And it's uh, a boom for resources, but we have to remember that this is to address uh, uh, achievement gaps that have existed for years now because we've let too many uh, populations, school districts uh, uh, fall behind in terms of resources and so we need to make sure that that, uh, that new funding gets where it needs to go and that takes scrutiny and oversight. Uh, we need to make sure that districts that need um, the uh, English language programming get it. We need to make sure that schools that need new technology get it. Uh, we hear a great deal that uh, kids that are falling behind get the extra help and the kids that are advanced academically get the special attention and that all the other kids in the middle uh, uh, are just kind of on their own. And we need to make sure that every kid gets the attention they need, and that uh, uh, is due to increased personnel and increased availability of resources. Uh, I can speak for my own son, he's six years old, and he's on the autism spectrum. And so he has an IEP, and he goes to a program uh, in Wilmington uh, that is kindergarten level curricula mixed with autism therapy. And you know, I want a program where my own son, who is a black, Jewish, adopted, child of divorce on the autism spectrum can thrive. And I'll be sensitive to making sure that everybody of every background, uh, geographically, demographically, and, and everything else, has the opportunity to thrive. I also do want to see, uh, like Ann mentioned, uh, a move away from the degree of testing that we do. Uh, and I also, uh, when it comes up, as it does from time to time, uh, I'm a supporter of firmly keeping the cap uh, uh, when it comes to charter schools. Um, with these new resources, I don't want to see that watered down by, in, I want to make sure that we use that money to invest in our public uh, district schools uh, and make sure that, uh, that, that they have the resources they need to uh, advance the way we hope they will under the Student Opportunity Act. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, again, I'm really thrilled that the Student Opportunity Act passed. Uh, our office worked on some of that legislation and drafting it and providing critical feedback. So it's a real thrill for me, having been a teacher in a classroom and knowing what a difference it can make when our funding formula is accounting for some of the costs of 21st century education with respect to English language learner students, students with disabilities, the growing cost of healthcare that's really taking, even if we're investing more money in the system, it's not necessarily getting to the classroom because of those types of costs. So I'm really thankful. Um, that it passed unanimously, that it got the governor's support. Um, and so moving forward, it's making sure that we are committed to the timeline of investment that we, that the legislation envisions. Um, you know, 
and, and keeping an eye on that. One thing that's helpful as well is there is attention to the charter school reimbursement formula in the Student Opportunity Act, um, and the legislature has signaled a really strong intention to make sure that, that is prioritized as well. You know, another thing that I think about in K-12 education as a teacher who worked in a, you know, a school where all of my kids, you know, came from an area that was, you know, challenged and parents working multiple jobs and school was really a safe haven for them, but they also brought with them the things that they carried in from the families. And so I work on the Safe and Supportive Schools Commission and we look a lot at the whole school and the whole child and thinking about ways in which we ensure that there are schools can be connected to community resources that we're thinking about the climate of the school and how students feel supported. Because if they're not comfortable being there, then we can't get to the point where they're actually learning. Um, so that's something that you know we could also look at even in the accountability system. We talk about that on Safe and Supportive Schools Commission, whether there are ways in which we can hold schools accountable for making sure they're supporting the whole child, not just how they're doing on a test. <coughs> I also want to point out that education isn't just K-12 <coughs> in our state. We also have early education, and we have higher education. And so in early education, I'd love to see us continue to invest in, at, the, at the state level in support for our Department of Early Education and Care, the licensing work they do, the quality um, reviews that they do and assist with early educators. I'd like to see early educators get paid more um, and that our reimbursement rates get higher for, for places that are providing um, child care for, for students with subsidies. Um, in higher education, we need to think about affordability um, the amount that we're investing in financial aid um, for students so that they're accessing our community colleges or state universities, UMass, and private schools as well. One thing that our office also worked on that I'm really excited about is we're the, I think we're the first in the nation that put in place a law related to sudden college closure. So a few years ago, a small college around Ida suddenly announced after it accepted and enrolled in a new class, after kids were there, we're going to be closing in about a month and a half. Faculty had no notice, students had no notice. This was a huge problem and it could happen again so far as we have a lot of small higher education institutions in the state. So now we have a law that legislature wrote and the Board of Higher Education just passed regulations on which I worked related to providing more notice to students and faculty to ensuring that there's more reporting out to our state agencies with respect to how financially uh, institutions are doing. So education, as you know, as someone who works in the field, is you know, a lifelong continuum. And so I'm thrilled we've done a lot of good work in each of these areas, and I look forward to continuing to really move us forward in each. Thank you. Um, in a nutshell, without seeing more details, I'm uh, inclined to be against getting rid of the abilities of communities to choose to uh, uh, implement it and, and uh, go for a Prop 2 and half override as they uh, see fit. So I, um, you know, working this out, uh, as you're saying, it, um, yeah, I would, I would support the elimination of Prop Two and a half, so that overrides were necessary, so that communities uh, would have the option to to increase revenue as they needed when they needed, and then be responsive to the voters in each community. Yep, yeah, that's a good question here in Melrose, since we just did a first override in many decades, and I was pleased to support that and pleased that the community got behind it. Um, and um, in terms of the commission, you'll see that a lot in legislation. When we're not quite sure how we want to come out, we'll suggest that we have a commission and we'll appoint people to it. I'd certainly be interested in hearing from them. Um, you know, there, they, one way is, and a lot of states don't have this prohibition, and essentially you hold people accountable who you elect when they make a determination about the budget, you can vote them out. So I recognize that I think we're in the, a, small minority of states that include Prop 2 and a half, but I sense as well that it's somewhat popular among our communities, so I want to have a chance to study what the commission you know, reveals, what their research shows, um, and then move from there into sort of communication and conversation with all of you about how you feel about it um, so that we can think about it together. That's a great question, Jack, one that I wasn't expecting. Um, so as, as an attorney, I'm going to be careful. I, I want to look at it as well, uh, but going back to what we've done in Wakefield, we have never had to do an override because and we, did, we um, increased the school budget to 11% several years ago. We um, poured extra money into the schools um, based on how we've managed our own budgets. That said, uh, it's 
it's frustrating at times when um, you want to do more things and you have that limit. I'm also very sensitive to certainly the elderly population in, in our um, town and in the district as well where property values are going up, their taxes are going up. So um, I think I would need to look at it. I could certainly see advocating something else, but I, I don't feel com comfortable right now saying, like, do away with the two and a half. Because um, we've managed to increase services and I think do well by our citizens within that, but it's a great point. How do you see the difference? What's your perception of the difference between how you would behave or what you would advocate for, what your process would be on a low flow level versus when you move up? Sam, good question. Um, so what I loved about working on the local level is the degree to which you can build relationships with your constituents and engage in a real conversation over time to help you process the policies that are coming before you or that you might want to propose yourself. Um, and I think, you know, one of my what I'm most proud of as a city councilor is the degree to which I've really um, paid into that process and really focused on learning from people who represent us in City Hall and then from people, my neighbors. And so, as you know, I do an email newsletter. It goes out to 1,400 people now. It talks about, here are the things that are coming up on our agenda. I want to hear from you about what you think about them. You know, here is what's and then on social media daily. It's here's what we're going to be talking about. Yes, we're going to be talking about. Sometimes it's the Board of Health. Because I think government works best when people feel engaged in it um, and feel that they have a voice in it. And so I don't see that type of dynamic changing for me as a state representative. I would still want to hear from you. I would still think about ways to reach you. Um, for seniors, I work with the mayor to put things in, on paper so that it gets delivered to some of the municipal buildings because not everyone is online. Um, you know, at the same time, there are things as a city councilor that I think, gosh, why do we do it this way? Let's change it. And I think, oh no, we can't do it at the local level. We have to do it at a state level. Um, and so that's really appealing to me when I've already worked for five years in the Commonwealth as an attorney on legislation, drafting it or reviewing it and sort of thinking about the ways in which departments at you know, the executive level and then the legislature can work together to sort of create a framework that can allow for um, municipal um, innovation and differentiation but can set some really important frameworks in which to work and also really invest in things that are working well at the local level. And I think coming um, to the State House, having had um, a local position is a really helpful perspective to bring um, because you can appreciate that there are things happening here and I see some of our municipal leaders in the audience where we're leading at the local level and certainly Wakefield and Malden are leading on things that it's really powerful narratives to share with colleagues and to build coalitions to continue to support that work and grow it. Um, but certainly some of the things that I care about in terms of transportation infrastructure, addressing climate issues, investing in public education, preserving civil rights. Those are things we can do at a municipal level, but the state can do even more. Um, and so I think there's a relationship there um, that is really powerful, and I'd love to continue to experience it with you. Thanks. I don't think I would change one bit from how I behave at the municipal level to how I behave at the state level. Um, I am what I am. I'm very comfortable working with people, talking with people. If you, I'm sure everyone has watched the uh, Wakefield Town Council meetings. <laughs> um, I don't watch them, but I, I really, I, I just am who I am. And I'm very comfortable talking to anyone at any level in that role. And it's fine, we, we have in Town Council, um, our present chairman um, has a constituent issue that you have to report on every, um, every meeting. And I don't have much to add to that. Typically it's, you know, what constituent has contacted you and what can we ask uh, Steve, to, um, Steve Mayo, our town, and the to do. I, I do that every day. I had two texts yesterday about lights being out in downtown that a, a crosswalk wasn't clear. Some traffic that was being impacted based on, on the National Grid Project. I get the text, forwarded to Steve Mayo, I forwarded to our DPW. Everything's happening. Everyone, you know, I get answers, I send it to the constituents. I do that constantly. So um, that's just how I have rolled, and that's how I will always roll. I think 
There are certain issues that I'd love to take up at the state. Kate mentioned certain issues with regard to civil rights, with regard to transportation. I'm also an Orange Line re, um, rider, and I was on one of the new trains last week, and I thought I was in heaven. <laughs> I was like, man, I couldn't believe it. And then I realized, oh, I'm this excited over <coughs> one train? Um, when I, for 30 years, I've been taking transportation. I have been the only woman in the room so often when I was a prosecutor. I know how to, how to manage that. Um, how to push back when I have to, when I have to. So I really am comfortable with the challenge, uh, with the challenge of, of taking this to the next level. Um, so I'm very comfortable with bringing it um, to the table. I'm, I'm going to apologize for some martial arts class. <laughs> 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 just kind of bear with us and keep your voices up. about English Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> keep your voices up. I'm sorry, Matt. Sure, no, not at all. So uh, it comes down to dialogue, and dialogue requires honesty and transparency, whether it's the local level or the state level. And that dialogue is a two-way street now. For residents, for constituents, you're always going to have the right answer, because you're talking about what your concerns are. You're going to be forthright, and you're going to make your voices heard. And when you show up in forums like this, you're doing a great job of that. Uh, there are problems that exist when it comes to transparency from state government to folks in communities. Uh, a lot of decisions are made behind closed doors, and that's not a metaphor. It's a literal closed door. It's room 227. It's down a hall behind a door that says members only. That's where a lot of the decisions when it comes to legislation, and especially the budget, get made. And, and then legislators come back and say, oh, well, we got a couple percent more for local aid, and we, and we got a couple percent more for this, and we got a couple percent more for that. But we don't hear about what the give and take was, what could have been, who was against increasing something that's needed by a larger margin. We don't have those debates on the floor of the House. Uh, I was proud the other day to sign the Act on Mass Transparency Pledge, uh, where I pledge to make every vote I take in a committee public. Right now, legislators' votes in committee at the committee level are not public. You don't know how your legislator voted. And Paul does a great job, but I'm sitting for the 160 uh, representatives. You don't know how they vote in committee. And then they come back and say, well, I'm for public education, I'm for public transportation. Well, how did you vote on this? Well, it was in committee and it got sent to study, which is legislative speak for the bill got killed. But we don't know what actually happens in the committee. And then when it comes to the floor, most of the decisions are made behind those closed doors so that they're, when it comes to the floor, it's a quick up or down vote, usually a voice vote, not even a roll call vote, so you can see the legs go on and which legislators voted what way and part of the Act on Mass Transparency Pledges, I will always support roll call votes so that we actually know who voted what way on what. Um, for instance, and I'll close on this because this is, this is an important microcosm of what happens in too many debates. About a month and a half ago, there was a major civil rights debate on Beacon Hill, and nobody knew about it because it was couched in the hands-free driving bill. The Senate version of the bill required record keeping on demographics for any stop made when somebody was stopped for you know, abusing the, the hands, for breaking the hands-free law. Speaker DeLeo in the House said, no, that's a little broad. We should only keep records when a citation is issued, not with every stop. Now, every civil rights organization said, no, the Senate version is better, because if a, an individual officer or a police department has a practice of racial profiling, they can stop a driver, check in their back seat, do what they need to do, and then not issue a citation, no records kept. Now, there are 160 members of the House, 40 members of the Senate, um, and so in committee, there's gonna be more House members, so the House gets, the, and the Speaker gets his way in committee. Then when it comes to conference committee, when the Senate and the House disagree on a bill, and it comes to conference committee, uh, the Speaker, uh, when it's a game of chicken, puts on a blindfold and drives, and the Senate can either vote down a bill or acquiesce to the speaker. And so the speaker got his way, and the hands-free driving bill only has record keeping for when a citation is issued. So what we did in that bill was create a whole new big loophole to allow racial profiling in Massachusetts. Stuff like that doesn't get the headlines, and it doesn't make its way to the voters so they, and, and, and the residents of the communities so that they know exactly what they're getting in their legislation. Uh, I'll be an advocate for making sure that we know what every aspect of every bill means and what the actual outcomes are when things get passed. Because it's great that we have a hands-free driving law, 
but now we also have a, a, a big loophole for racial profiling that should never uh, have gotten past, and I would have been a voice. Uh, as a progressive, I would have said, you know, I want the hands-free driving law, but I'm gonna vote no until we close this loophole. I'm not gonna throw civil rights under the bus. There are red lines with me, and I will never throw civil rights under the bus, I will never throw kids under the bus, and I will never throw healthcare access under the bus to get anything passed so I can put out a, a press release saying, hey, we got this bill passed, without knowing exactly what's in it. Uh, two bills in committee that may come to the floor, and let's just assume there's a roll call vote. I'd be interested in how you would vote on the bill to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day, and the bills prohibiting public schools from using Native American medicine. Yeah, it's your turn, right? Um, I'll just, no problems with changing indigenous, Columbus Day of Indigenous um, um, Persons Day. So we're a Wakefield warrior. <laughs> um, and we have Native American folks in our town who have argued about keeping that simple. Um, Multi-generational veterans in our town um, who feel that how the, the warrior is represented is not offensive um, for them. So um, I would, you know, I would have to, I would have no problem changing it. I don't think it's it's a mockery, but I have talked to these, I've talked to these families who are multi-generational who, who are very proud of that and proud of their indigenous um, uh, clothing that they wear on our July 4th parade. That the, folks who are Native Americans. So um, it's probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but I, in our own town, we've had this debate, and um, the people I feel that would be most impacted by it um, have argued that we keep regular borders. It doesn't mean I, I would vote against, um, that I would not change my mind on that. I'd have to hear more of a dialogue, but I'm just uncomfortable saying I would absolutely say no based on my own I fully support both pieces of legislation. Um, when it comes to the mascots, for instance, uh, if, let's say there's a, a new school pops up uh, and I say, you know what, uh, we wanna celebrate the Jewish people. We're gonna be the Stoneham rabbis. Rabbis are a wonderful source of wisdom. No, just because it's how something has been done for a long time is not a good reason to keep doing it that way, regardless of whether it's a matter of sensitivity to different populations, it's a matter of uh, another aspect of the, the legislative or budget process. Just because that's how something has been for a long time is not the reason to keep doing it that way. I've heard in these exact debates on this very issue about the mascots, uh, I've heard a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, consistent uh, arguments from the side that I disagree with. One is, well, when I was in school 30 years ago, it was this. And so we can't change you know, my history and my heritage and my school experience. And I say, we're not changing your school experience. That's the past. And it's a wonderful part of your past for you. But the future is different. And it's these kids in the future that are going to be experiencing this. And it's a different time. And you got to accept it. It's one way or the other. And the people, you know, people are going to be disappointed if you're on the losing side of the argument, this is my side of the argument. The other argument is I hear people say, you know, what if we were the Melrose Marshmallows? Uh, okay, so let other schools say, oh, we're gonna go play the Marshmallows and kick their butts. And then we win. We make our way to the Super Bowl, and the Marshmallows are the Super Bowl champs. Great. Let other teams uh, uh, worry about the mascot name, but, but it's better than sending the message that a prejudice, even if it's well-intentioned, even if the underlying message sounds positive, uh, uh, Jews are hard workers, Asians are good at math, uh, Native Americans are leaders, and therefore they should be the mascot. No, that's the wrong message to send. We have to end that practice. That seems like a no-brainer to me, and I'm happy to communicate that to anyone who's uncomfortable uh, with that being the case. Thanks for asking the question. I know we've talked about this in the past. Um, and both of these for me on a personal level, I absolutely appreciate and support moving forward 
both to modernize the language that we use and the symbols that we, um, you know, reflect, um, you know, in a public way. Um, I'm very happy to see that we are, I think there is progress on both of these. So, you know, Harrison has come home from first grade um, with Indigenous People Day curriculum that's happening here in the Melrose Public Schools. So we're moving toward this, I really think. Um, as the mascot, even here in town, we've seen the symbol, the symbol change over time. Um, and I really, as you know, care deeply about the process and bringing people into the fold as we think about laws. So for me, I want to see the conversation continue to move in this direction. I would help usher it in that direction. I'm concerned about the degree to which a state gets so strident that it feels um, like there's a sort of boomerang effect from the communities um, and that people get resentful. Uh, and so to me, where I see the dialogue moving in a progressive way, I would be a champion for that. I would support legislation to the degree that I feel like we have done the hard work of explaining to people um, why it's important to, um, you know, to move this direction. It's not something that I would come out of the gate necessarily um, you know, um, putting in as, a, as sort of where I'm going to stand right now because I do want to hear from people in Wakefield about what they care about and how to bring them into the fold. Certainly in Melrose, we've seen there's been contention over this issue. Uh, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law live in Tewksbury um, where they are the red men. I thought that was a joke when I first went to one of my um, uh, now husband's uh, football games. It was, uh, you know, alarming that in the you know, this still existed. But even in that town, you know, there they tried to bring it to town committee. It failed. You know, it really fractured the community. And now they're sort of at a position where, um, you know, I want to see better leadership there. Um, I'm happy to be part of that conversation and try to bring people um, to consensus on this. Currently, I guess I think it was in 2000, uh, incarcerated felons lost the right to vote in Massachusetts. But there's been uh, some pushes over the past year or two, and pretty recently, uh, to reinstate voting rights for incarcerated felons. So I just wanted to see if, when, if you, uh, if the see if you would fight to reinstate voting rights for incarcerated felons. Uh, well, I'm, uh, first I'm thrilled that uh, Florida, for instance, has uh, passed its uh, amendment for to allow uh, released felons to regain the right to vote. Uh, and I want everyone who's released from prison to have the right to vote because in addition to having paid your service, you know, having paid your debt to society, it reduces recidiv recidivism to get your right to vote back. With currently incarcerated felons, it's something I honestly struggle with because if somebody is in especially for a violent offense and they have their freedom taken away, specifically uh, uh, as a result of that action, as a result of that crime, how does um, their voting rights play into that loss of freedom and that penalty? And so that's something I struggle with, and I want to get to a yes on that. Um, whether it's a review process similar to parole, in which somebody uh, applies to, to get their voting rights reinstated proactively, um, that's something I'm open to exploring. I'm hesitant to say from the jump, uh, restoring voting rights for all incarcerated felons off the bat, but I want to get to a yes on that, and it's something I do want to explore further. Thanks for the question. Um, one thing I'm happy about in this area is the criminal justice reform that has been enacted you know, by the legislature recently, which is trying to really, um, we've looked at that from you know, a juvenile justice standpoint and trying to recognize um, you know, broadening jurisdiction for juvenile offenses and thinking about when we start to try people as adults. So I'm glad that we're sort of picking up on the science of things and modernizing there. I agree um, with Matt that once someone is no longer incarcerated, there should not be, you know, they, they've paid their debt to society and we need to make sure that they are fully engaged in citizenship again, including in voting rights. I think at this time, I couldn't say that I would support um, voting rights for incarcerated felons. Um, it was actually a question that was asked yesterday on Washington Post. They had this answer all the questions and see which Democratic so candidate you're most like. Um, and um, you know, I think I sort of answered in the same way I just said, which aligned me with a good number, I believe, of the current candidates for president. But it's obviously something people are talking about. I think that's great um, to have as part of the conversation. And I'm always happy to learn more and hear from you about you know a different opinion. 
So I think I'm going to echo. I took that Washington Post um, quiz and I paused at that question. I have no problem with um, felon, felon, anyone who's released from prison having the right to vote. No one should ever lose their right to vote permanently. Pre presently incarcerated made me pause. And I was even thinking, as a former prosecutor, in someone who's been in prisons, um, administratively, how that looks. I mean, it's a little crazy, but how, how would you make that um, happen with certainly violent um, felons? But I'm willing to hear um, um, the argument about it. I'm, I'm certainly open to a discussion, but right now, I, I don't think I could commit to saying present violent felons should um, have that. We're watching on the television eventually, the question was what we could do about the opioid crisis, particularly around young adults. And this is something that I think it's, you know, we've seen some gains and some progress in this in Massachusetts, but it's still really an epidemic here and around the country. So I'm glad you raised that. Um, it's something that I've heard a lot from different, um, uh, you know, our different police forces in our district and obviously statewide. Um, at the K-12 level, we've been investing in recovery high schools, which is a program that supports students who have been dealing with substance abuse, including opioids. Um, and trying to provide education to them in an environment um, that is re reflecting the needs of their, you know, their health recovery as well. Um, so being attuned to that and thinking about supports in the schools is critically important. Um, at the state level, we can also, you know, with the, the increased investment in um, Student Opportunities Act, um, districts will have more money to think about things like mental health supports, um, substance abuse supports and certainly partnering with, for example, in Melrose, our health department, or in Malden and, and Wakefield as well, um, and focusing also on the degree to which um, I think we are at the state level considering um, the, the mental health work that, that can be supported in other agencies, as well as um, social workers throughout the, the Commonwealth are doing really good work. Um, we have a state law that sort of is with commitments to invest there. Um, our rates are still pretty low for behavioral health and, um, and mental health supports and health care reimbursement rates. So we can look at that as well in terms of making sure that families can get access to supports outside of the school also. Um, so these are a few thoughts, um, but it's certainly a priority that we need to keep our attention on going forward. It's a great question, and I think um one that we've tackled in, in Wakefield recently, and I'm sure Melrose and Melvin have done as well. We have infused funds for um, recovery coaches and substance abuse workers that are housed in our police department. Um, so not only can, if someone is arrested, um, or if a family is having issues, um, that they can right away um, get those folks services, but they're now going into our streets. So our recovery coaches are going into the streets, talking to, um, folks who are sitting on benches that may look like um, you know, they, they might have a problem and having a dialogue um, and having great success. We um, funded a half-time person, we're now funding a full-time, we want to add something. I think we also have to get into the schools much earlier than we do. So I think starting at the elementary school, you have to have, um, whether it's social workers or healthcare workers, attuned to look for signs um, of opioid addiction, whether in the child or in the family. Um, I know I, um, as associate dean of students at the law school and in working with students with disabilities, the amount of my law students who, who have had um, some substance abuse issues and certainly mental health issues, and I think having um, us educated to spot those, get these students help um, immediately has made a great difference. But it comes down to funding and putting the resources in at the young level, um, in our police departments, in our fire departments so that we can not tackle it as a crime necessarily and, and, and to really get these folks help. Yeah, over the last half decade, uh, the legislature passed uh, two large pieces of legislation that involved more resources for more recovery beds, uh, reducing uh, quantities dispensed, uh, and a number of other uh, oversight uh, uh, measures. But when it comes to the youth in particular, something that I'd like to see actually with the Student Opportunity Act is to have some of those resources used for more mental health and wellness resources and personnel in the schools. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, regular uh, surveys of, of youth, we see uh, you know, the, increase, the dramatic increase in vaping, uh, opioid addiction, 
and uh, uh, suicidal ideation due to stress and trauma amongst our young people. And so we definitely need to, to allocate more resources to mental health and wellness in the schools. Um, one thing I want to mention along those lines is there's legislation uh, uh, pertaining to um, general health, uh, uh, sex education, uh, physical health, drug, edu drug education that's age appropriate throughout the, throughout the uh, years uh, at every grade level. And uh, opponents don't like the bill because it acknowledges the LGBT community. It uh, uh, is not, uh, um, meanwhile, uh, gay youth are three to five times more likely to consider and act on uh, suicidal ideation than straight youth, and trans youth are six to eight times more likely to think about and act on suicidal ideation than cisgender youth. And so legislation that uh, has increased education um, uh, and gives kids a vocabulary and a framework to think about some of these issues more, more comprehensively uh, is also a suicide reduction bill and a, and a mental health bill and a mental wellness bill. And so that needs to get passed to, uh, to for the good of uh, our school children. How will you assess that you've heard from uh, different voices in the district, lift up constituencies that may not be squeaky wheels, and how will you prioritize um, reaching out to folks who might not be actively reaching out to you? That's your job. Your job is to make sure that you reach all of these, um, all of your constituents and to not, you have to get into the community for that. So the squeaky wheels will always get you. Um, you certainly, um, they get me at town council now. But to, to know where else you need to go in, into the community, to what other groups you need to talk to, um, and to just make yourself accessible, that's, that's what we have to do. We can't just um, respond to the squeaky wheels. We have to know um, the, the issues that are happening in our community. We have to know um, who may be being affected that we're not hearing from. And I think that's having an open dialogue with law enforcement, having a, a very um, clear line of communication with the teachers. Um, and to just hear, perhaps, of certain pockets, as you say, that, we, that may not come to us. But that's our job. So I think um, you just have to be out there. You have to be listening. Sure. Um, a quick uh, example uh, that uh, uh, serves as kind of a, a microcosm of what I would do is uh, during my time in Senator Lewis's office, uh, he, like many legislators, holds office hours around the district, and that involves people coming to him. He's you know, set up at the senior center or the library on a regular basis, and folks with concerns can come to him. Um, but it occurred to me, well, there, uh, I think it was in our, towards the end of our first year uh, in office, uh, there were a number of pieces of legislation involving humane treatment of animals that touched on a lot of other issues, including domestic violence and, and other areas. So um, I suggested to Senator Lewis, and we got rep then Representative Broder's office involved too, and we held an office hour in the Melrose Dog Park to reach uh, uh, that population that might not think, oh, I'm gonna go to the, the senior center to talk about uh, any concerns, but we went to the, the dog park to talk about humane treatment of animals legislation. Uh, that's, I'm going to work with uh, uh, whether it's a Melrose Pet and Bike Committee, whether it's any community organization, or whether it's the schools to reach uh, young people uh, or, or demographics uh, and uh, areas of the community that are in touch. I'll, I'll seek to be proactive and make sure that it's not just a matter of the community coming to me to register concerns, but that I'm uh, uh, routinely in the community, that the campaign such as it is, doesn't stop at the election, but that I continue reaching out, knocking on doors, and being in the community uh, throughout the year so that when there are concerns, I'm at your door and, and you can uh, uh, access me directly. So I love this question. Um, it makes me think about when I was a teacher. Um, and at the beginning of every year, I would get my roster for seventh grade classes and I would go down the list and call every family who I was going to have the privilege of working with. And many of them were sort of taken aback because the teacher had never called them. Um, and we, I introduced myself, I let them know how excited I was to have their student in my classroom, I 
gave them a phone number, um, and it made a big difference to start out hearing from them and then hearing from me in a very positive way um, when many of them were, frankly, sort of disenfranchised from coming to the school. They didn't feel totally welcome there. And so um, I have, you know, I think always appreciated um, the importance of relationships and listening, maybe partially because I grew up in the Quaker church, and so that's all about you sit in silence and listen for that of God within you to share with other people, and you listen to their sharing as well. So perhaps that's where um, some of this comes from. And I remember just as an aside, I lived with other teachers. I would often call as well from our home um, line that was registered in my name, and the next day Denisha would come back from and be having like dinner and she'd say, all my kids were like, who is this Catherine Lipper, you know, who's calling, you know, uh, you know, uh, because she would also use the phone sometimes to call. So I was not only known in my school, but in her school as well as, <laughs> who's Catherine Lipper calling? I mean, as a city councilor, I have really tried my best to make myself accessible to people and to be responsive, certainly when they reach out to us. I know that you've done a great job of that as well, um, and thinking about ways to share information with the community. It's easy in some ways on social media and through the email newsletter to reach people, but I, I recognize that not everyone signs up for that, not everyone accesses information digitally. Um, so I would certainly as well continue a tradition that we had from our you know, former esteemed representative, now mayor, of having office hours or the senator, um, and thinking about ways to get to places where people um, maybe also live that aren't quite as easy to reach. I mean, I'm fairly intrepid when I go door knocking. I will ring a bunch of doors until I get into an apartment building so I can meet that person and possibly meet a few others. Um, and I would continue that as well. Um, but thinking about if there are opportunities to, um, to go to those places, not only in a campaign cycle. And I would look to my other colleagues who have yet had some success in innovative ways of reaching communities who maybe aren't always as involved as um, they'd like to be to make sure that there are ways for me to tap into their voices and their views. I'd like to thank our candidates for uh, being willing to come out and, and share your thoughts with us. I'd like to thank you all for coming.
so you can teach them math, then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're correctly buckled in the back seat.